This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Paul Oyer, who is a professor of economics at Stanford Graduate School of Business, also the author of a couple of wonderful books, uh, a new book that's coming out, I guess it's already out, maybe it's coming out pretty soon. It's called An Economist Goes to the Game. And what's the subtitle? Ah, How to Throw Away $580 Million and Other Surprising Insights from the Economics of Sports. And your previous book was called Everything I Ever Needed to Know About Economics. I Learned from Online Dating. And by the way, this book was actually used <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a textbook. You can see here uh, here at the um, high school business uh, for our intro uh, economics class to kind of stimulate a little bit of, of, of interest. And, and I think one of the messages of both books is that, you know, you can apply economics to just about anything, right? Economics provides you with a, a perspective, uh, kind of a toolbox that kind of enables you to see things that you wouldn't otherwise see before. And this is kind of when I, when I teach my MBA students, I, I kind of say, what you're doing is you're adding lenses, you know, you're, you're, you're accumulating a series of, of like frameworks and lenses that you can kind of pop on and off in, in sequence to kind of clarify what you're seeing out there in the world, not only kind of in your professional life, but also in your personal life and your family life and so forth. And so I guess that what I want to start off with is um, kind of a high level question about what we might call the industrial organization of the economics profession. So I interviewed David McAdams recently, and, and he wrote a book where he took a, a specific tool of economics, game theory, and applied it to a wide range of topics, everything from you know medicine to sports and so forth. And in your two books, you, you take a specific area of human life, dating or sports, and then you apply a whole bunch of different tools to, to that, that domain. And, you know, when we look at the economics profession, there are various specializations within the profession, some of which are kind of tool oriented, like game theory, others of which are kind of domain, like in your case, labor economics or, you know, personnel economics. And so I was wondering, you know, how does, how do these specializations emerge? Like, why do we have the ones that we have? I mean, we have here at Berkeley, we have an agricultural economics department, which has, you know, there's 3% of the economy is agriculture, but we don't have a dating economics department and yet, <laughs> or a mating economics department, and yet every single human being probably, you know, at least at some point, unless they're in the, you know, clergy uh, is, is participating in, in this market. So how, like, why is it that economics seems to focus on some things more than, than others? And, and how do these kind of specializations emerge? Well, I think, I think the answer is, a combination of historical accident and then the market reacting. So the market for economics research is a market, just like mm -hmm. any of the ones we study. So historical accident led to the agricultural economics department at Berkeley, right? And the fact that there are agriculture, agricultural economics departments at all the land grant universities in the Midwest, right? There's a huge, I'm sure there's a huge ag econ department at um, Michigan State, for example. Mm -hmm fact check me i might be wrong on that but but historically you would certainly expect that from these land grant colleges because they were focused on agriculture and so they they put money into that and so the market was there for research in those areas and economists went and studied it over time however as the number of people working in agriculture changed from you know probably 70 percent when those departments started to what is it two two or three percent now you do see that there's been a dramatic decline in how much economists study this. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the um, agricultural economics department at Berkeley is a great example because it's not really an agricultural economics department anymore. It's now a sustainability and natural resource economics department because that's where the that's where the research funds are. That's where the pages and journals are going to be spent and so forth. So it's a slow moving market and a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, old institutions and in economics that have big endowments and maybe can continue to work that isn't quite as relevant as it once was. But basically, market forces drive economics just, you know, and we, we practice what we preach, whether we want to or not, because that's how things work. I mean, I'm a, I'm a labor economist, so that's 
always been, at least for a hundred plus years at the forefront of economic, not meaning mm -hmm. the number one thing or anything, but it's always been a, a leading field and it comes and goes as far as just how prominent it is. But labor economists with the Nobel prize, labor economists take their turns as chair of as a president of the economics associations and the various things. So labor is a pretty steady thing. Of course, there are some ebbs and flows. And then, and then within labor economics, there's trends mm -hmm. that we follow because again, that the, the market dominant, you know, the market has an effect. So for example, when I started as an economist in the nineties, you would go, if you wanted to, I certainly did this when I wrote my thesis, you would go to um, one of the central government databases, like this current population survey, and you download a data set. And luckily I got there after tapes, mm -hmm. <laughs> by, the time, by the time I got there, we could do these on computers or at least on Unix machines. And you would download this, these public data sets and run your data. Well, over time, research has gotten a lot better because of two things in labor economics, two areas really have enabled us to take our research to whole new areas. One is um, countries have put together much more detailed data sets. The Nordic country, you can't believe how much of labor economics research now looks at Norway and Sweden. You know, these are countries the size of Tennessee yeah. and, and uh, they're particularly and weird, like right? That. In that, in the, in the terminology <laughs> of the, uh, of the kind of sociologists, right? They're, they're not, mm -hmm. They're, they're peculiar <laughs> and weird in the W-E-R-D yeah. uh, context. And, and, and weird in their homogeneity, yeah. right? So the United States is much more heterogeneous. But the, the other way our field has changed dramatically is I wrote a couple of papers recently um, where we use data from Uber. And that just wasn't yeah. done. 30 years ago, companies wouldn't share their data because they were scared of their competition having it or some, I don't even know why. And now the tech companies and many other companies say, wait, we have all this data. Let's both as a service to the society or good public, you know, you can be more cynical and say they want good public uh, relations and they want the regulators to leave them alone. So they do this nice thing. Also, you know, just for free insight into what their data tells them, they go out and they let academics snoop around in their data and publish papers and and we've all learned a lot about the world thanks to that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we have economics departments that are standalone economic departments, and we have economics departments that are inside of of business schools. But but it seems like the things that you would describe as being in the province of labor economics, at least within the business schools, seems to be dominated by the organizational behavior folks, right, to some degree, right? So you talk a little bit in one of your books about the difference between kind of economics departments, which are kind of more positive and, and business schools, which are more kind of normative, where they're providing you with these, yeah. you know, how to, or here's how you do this stuff. Right. But, but there's, it seems to be this right. chasm between the kind of mechanism design people and the kind of leadership people. So I remember when I, I launched a course on um, HR about five or six years ago, and I remember people thinking, this is crazy. Like nobody's going to be interested in this stuff. Right. But it's like, well, actually it's, it's pretty, it's, that's kind of an area that is now bridging the gap between these two kind of separate disciplines. You know, why, why has there been this divide between the folks who believe that it's all about incentives and the others that believe it's all about kind of psychology, right? Are you seeing these labor economics bleed into organizational behavior at this point? Um, I think that's an interesting question. I think there's some bleeding and then there's some further separating mm -hmm. over time. So you've, you can divide, at least at Stanford, we can divide our organizational behavior scholars into psychologists and sociologists. Mm -hmm. So they're one, at least here, they're one group, but kind of divided. And I used to teach the core human resources class here at Stanford. And I would teach the same syllabus as two of my colleagues. One was Jim Barron, who's not, no longer at Stanford, who was a sociologist. And the other is Charles O'Reilly, who's a, a social psychologist here at Stanford. We would all teach the same syllabus. And I'm pretty sure if you sat in on all three of our classes, you wouldn't know that you were taking, <laughs> that. <laughs> you wouldn't know you were taking the same class. Because I would be talking, you know, like you said, about incentives, and they would be talking about gift exchange and other ideas. Now, some of that has bled in for sure. We have 
behavioral economists, we, we accept more of the thinking in behavioral economics gift exchange, which I just mentioned is a good idea. George Akerlof, mm. economics Nobel Prize winner, has written about this. So it must be, it must be, <laughs> it must be valid. But I do think that at the same time, the the fields of there was a there was a time where universities were just dying to get people to do interdisciplinary work. They still are, but back there was real push for it about twenty years ago, and the economists were the worst at playing in each other, in other people's sandboxes. <laughs> it wasn't that much good interdisciplinary work that came out of economics, whereas some other fields like biomedicine and things like that, they really was huge breakthroughs in terms of working together. So I have very good conversations with my colleague and, colleagues in organizational behavior, but it's still pretty rare to see economists get outside and really do dig in and do serious scholarship with people outside of economics. Well, now, by the way, we're oh, sorry, just you mentioned economists have found their way into business schools. Of course, we're really labor economists included are we're very uh, imperialistic is maybe the wrong word, but we're we really like we're we're all over universities now. So if you look at Stanford, we have a bunch of institutes with economists we have the education school has a bunch of economists the med school like we're we're and the political science department at stanford is basically an economics department or at least a good portion of it is mm -hmm. so we're 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 getting out and for better or worse uh making <laughs> making our way into other areas well i mean if you talk to most ceos particularly in silicon valley uh, about what their biggest concerns are. I mean, talent acquisition, talent retention, and kind of getting the most out of their talent. That seems to be, you know, their their number one concern um, kind of on, on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And so kind of HR has moved from what we might think of as a, you know, hygiene department where you make sure that everybody kind of gets their benefits to a department where, you know, it's strategic, right? Figuring out how to manage this this, this human capital. And it, you know, the bulk of your expenses are probably in the form of compensation and, and so forth. And, and, uh, and, and so, you know, a lot of science has to be brought to the table and we're starting to see more and more kind of HR workplace analytics and so forth. But, you know, this goes all the way back to Frederick Taylor. Um, you know, when I, when I kick off my, my class, I always start with Billy Bean and your book on sports draws from a lot of different disciplines, but, but, you know, the thing about HR and sports or the thing about kind of personnel economics in sports is that it, it dominates the conversation, right? It is so transparent. So do you think that sports, uh, I mean, in your book, you talk about all the things that you can learn about economics that help you understand sports, but can, can other industries learn from kind of what sports is doing, right? Can we look at sports? I mean, Billy Bean, is he, is he kind of the 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 leader that he's made out to be in the, the, the book and the movie, right? Is is that sort of a telling everybody kind of where they're headed, where we're going to start using more and more analytics in the workplace? I think the simple answer is yes and no. And so the yes part is absolutely analytics is going to be more and more critical in any field. And I talked about Uber, mm -hmm. you know, the studies we did with Uber and Uber drivers, for example, there's just all sorts of things being measured about them and the firm is able to update their systems and incentivize drivers using all sorts of incredibly detailed and complicated, but very grounded in reality um, analytics. So that's fantastic. Now, and, and again, absolutely more and more. I have a colleague here at Stanford named Amir Goldberg and um, I've seen him teach a couple of times on his, he does people analytics and culture analytics. And the kinds of things you can do these days in HR departments with analytical information, it's just fantastic. So at, yes, for sure, the money ball idea is definitely going on in corporation. Now there's a big, the reason I said no is there's a big limit to that. And that is the big difference between a baseball player or any athlete and most managers in most organizations is the ability to measure their performance effectively, right? So I can measure, um, Mike Trout is an example I use a lot in the book of somebody who's paid very well because he's an incredible player. And we know how incredible he is because of the statistics. 
and the statistics have gotten more and more advanced. So you don't just look at batting average or things we used to look at, which were pretty good indicators to begin with, but we've gotten even that much better at studying things. But, and you just don't have that even for, you know, members of the faculty here at Stanford Business School, we have pretty observable things like journal publications and the like, but there's a lot of unmeasured things from those quantitative measures. So if I have X number of journal publications and so many of them are in top publication or in top journals and so forth, that tells you a lot, but it there's a lot more to be had about, well, what's the actual influence? What's the quality of that work and so forth. And then if you take it down a notch to a middle, like a, let's take us the senior staff here at Stanford Business School, managers who make the school run and are incredibly important. Well, we just, it's all subjective. The measures there are all subjective and very hard to, it's not impossible and we're getting better at this, but it's very hard to apply analytics in the money ball sense. Well, I think if you look at the critiques of kind of compensation uh, schemes, it, they're, they're kind of split down the middle. I mean, you got half the people saying that you know, we really need to use more objective criteria and there's too much sub subjectivity. And then the other half is saying, no, 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 we're actually, we, we need more discretion because these objective measures, right, incentivize kind of the, the, the wrong behaviors, right? So for instance, you know, teaching to the test and, and, and so forth, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, how, how, how do we, how should we be thinking about, you know, balancing those things? Is, is there, is there going to, is there kind of a, a I mean, within personnel economics, are, are we getting any closer to figuring out, uh, you know, how to design work in such a way that we can kind of measure the things that we need to measure? Sure. And um, I mean, the simple answer is both of those perspectives are right or both of them are wrong, depending on how you want to look at it. And it depends a lot on the situation. So I wrote my, I actually wrote my, um, doctoral dissertation on how salespeople play games with their compensation yeah. system. And, and, um, you know, it's a great example of you, for most salespeople, you have these very straightforward objective measures of performance. It can be just plain sales or to the, if they have enough, if they have, um, if they have the discretion to affect prices, it would be more contribution margin or some, some measures along those lines. And, and those are great, but they're never perfect. So um, I used my my thesis was about these salespeople, and it was motivated by the fact that I used to work at companies, and like in the fourth quarter, they would these salespeople would go crazy and do all sorts of things that were you know borderline immoral to make their quota for the year, and um, you know in a perfect world you wouldn't incentivize along those lines, but there's a trade off. So strong objective measures are great. But they do lead to people, if they're not perfectly aligned with, with the uh, outcome that the firm wants or the employer wants, then there are what we call distortions. And it's just a matter of trade-offs. Now, what your question hints at is, this is all getting a little bit better because over time, performance measurement has gotten better because we have more analytics, just as the measures of Mike Trout have gotten better, so have the measures of individual people within corporations. They're nowhere near as good and object as objective as those of Mike Trout, but they're for many jobs, they're better than they were 20, 30 years ago. And so as a result, we can use more pay for performance than we used to, but you can definitely in any job, you can overdo it. If you have too much incentive, then you're just giving people, unless you really have 100% alignment between what you can measure and what you want, then you're going to have problems if you overdo it. Well, you have a wonderful chapter in the book about the kind of statistical discrimination and taste-based discrimination. And you talk about how, right, when the performance measures are more subjective, of course, this allows more kind of bias to, to, to creep in, right? And so it's, it's difficult to distinguish between kind of a discretion, you know, and subjective assessment and, and, and bias. And, and this is why we got so many, you know, French, Hockey goalies. I thought that was that was fascinating. <laughs> yeah, that was an academic paper written by somebody else, just to be clear. And uh, it is. It's a really interesting managerial, managerially relevant point. And it is that if you have um, in certain positions, 
you can objectively measure the success of somebody. And what these what these economists found was that in those positions, you found less discrimination between uh, French Canadian and other types of goalies and other types of hockey players. Whereas if you have if you have a job, say baseball outfielder, where you can really measure things very well. You're going to see the market get rid of discrimination pretty quickly because the the biases I have as a manager that oh you know the African Americans aren't as good at this or mm -hmm. or oh the French Canadians are better at that or whatever it is those things are hard to hold on to when the statistics are right in your face but it's easier to hold on to them when you're just measure looking at things and your gut tells you this person or that person well then implicit biases are much much more likely to come out they're still likely to come out but in other settings but the, the more objective the measure the better we can get rid of uh implicit bias and you also talked about statistical discrimination in in dating markets right and you know <laughs> these, these dating markets um they they resemble in in many ways kind of the the kidney markets and other markets that i talked to al roth about a couple months ago Right. I don't think most people think of the date that they're participating in a sort of a, a matching uh, market. Um, but I, I found the discussion that borrowed from all sorts of different areas of economics, you know, very, very enriching. And the, there, there was when you have this whole chapter on search, I just finished teaching my uh, money and banking class and I spent a whole lecture on the difference between kind of direct search markets, brokered markets, and and dealer markets, and I, for some reason, I don't think anybody tip, that's typically not 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 covered. And I can't remember where I got the original discussion many many years ago, but kind of that that you know the the structure of the of the market seems to be you know critical to the functioning of of the market. So you know what is it about the the mating market that that makes it, I, I guess, kind of so so illustrative of all these many concepts that we have in economics, like network effects and so forth. Yeah, it's, that's basically, um, you know, I'm going to translate your question as why did you write a book about the dating <laughs> well, market? Well, you, because that's basically where you just, well, you, you mentioned that you were and, participating and, in and, it as, as in the, at the yeah. time you wrote the book, but right. So, but the answer, I mean, I'm going to answer your question by telling you how I started the book because it really is the same thing. What happened is I I went back on the dating market. I was, um, you know, I, I um, went back on the dating market about oh 12 years ago now for the first time in 20 or 30. Wait, wait, did years you did you think about whatever, did you because, did you think oh I'm single now or did you think I'm on the dating market? Like, is that do economists actually think <laughs> that you know I'm on the dating market or do they think like oh I need to go find a, a wife or whatever? <laughs> No, I, it's, that's a great point. Cause at first I just thought, oh, I'm, I'm single again. Let's go find a new significant other and let's go, you know, date and whatever. And, and I, um, so I just, like you said, I was just like, oh, I'm single again. Let's, let's fix that. <laughs> so I, it was more, it was recent enough that you would use online. The obvious way to do that was to go to an online dating site. So I did. And, um, but then I quickly changed my outlook because I went on my first date and I came back and I was like, wow, I mean, it, it's a market. It's just, and as a labor economist, maybe being a labor economist, it was more obvious to me. And one who has studied the matching, the efficient matching mm -hmm. of firms to workers. So from my perspective, the dating market is no different than the employment market, except that no money changes mm -hmm. hands. And that's what made it particularly interesting to me to write a book about because people think, oh, economics, it's money, it's banking, it's whatever terms they're associ they associate with economics. And as a microeconomist, I don't see it that way at all, right? Money is just money is just a convenience by which we exchange. But you know, the world is about utility; it's not about money. From from uh, so matching people in the dating market is really just the same as employer as employment in the sense that so if you think about the most classic commodity market let's just say i don't know steel right you or oil you buy and sell oil every barrel of oil is the same at least within certain uh, classifications of oil and we just buy and sell it it's total commodity well 
both labor markets and dating markets are exactly the opposite of that. Everybody's different. So when you think about the dating market, you know, we don't just draw a supply and demand curve and say, oh, I'll just take whoever I find. You are trying to find the best match. And this is what Al Roth, you know, for those of you who were listening to Greg's interview with Al Roth, you already know a lot about Al's thought very carefully about two-sided markets where there's a lot of heterogeneity on, two, on each side. And the, the labor market and the dating market, to me, are the primary examples. It's not about finding a match. It's about finding the best possible match. But you mentioned but, but the that, But that's why, that's why you can have both uh, vacancies and <laughs> unemployment at the same time. Whereas, you know, in exactly. a traditional market, that there, there'd be a market clearing price and there would never be, you know, either one of those, right? Exactly. And that's why we have, exactly. So if all goods were undifferent, like we don't, you know, of course there are shortages in the short term and whatnot in the oil market, but basically the market, the price clears the market. Whereas in um, a guy named Dale Mortensen and uh, was probably the best, he won the Nobel prize. Uh, he was my colleague at Northwestern, unfortunately he's passed away now. He's a wonderful economist and a wonderful man. And um, he, Design, he did a lot of the theory to explain exactly what you said, that in these markets that where people are searching and the products are differentiated in the labor market, you end up with unemployment. And um, he, won, he won the Nobel Prize. I, uh, I didn't win the Nobel Prize, but I did. Uh, I, do, I was very proud of myself for talking about how um, the same exact thing plays out in the uh, dating market. And people end up lonely, which is also known as um, romantic unemployment, right. right? So that was that. <laughs> but it's basically exactly the same economic force. So, I mean, you'd, you'd think that the Chicago economists would always be single, right? Because they would just assume that, you know, the match <laughs> would happen kind of spontaneously, right? Because markets are efficient. So, you know, you shouldn't be single. It should just happen magically, right? Where the, Where there's no, because there's no... I don't know. I I think they understood about heterogeneous right. goods too. So I think the, myth, you're right the mythical it, Chicago they, economist they, that walks over the twenty dollar bill. Exactly. That person, right? Should exactly. Be single forever. Exactly. Yeah. I, I I think that makes a lot of sense. But uh, yeah. Well, I mean, and you also, um, you know, one of the things that you talk about the impact on sports is this kind of radical increase in, in inequality, right? Where you see some players yeah. earning 40, $50 million a year, and then others, you know, making considerably less. You, you also mentioned that the dating market, right, has a lot more inequality now, um, in part because of the lower search cost. So presumably, at one point in our history, right, you know, you could be a piano player, and you would just sort of, you know, play piano for the you know, small geography around you. And, you know, if you were a baseball player, you'd play for a relatively small audience. But, but now I guess you didn't never mentioned Baumol's paradox, but I, I guess there's, there's, there's an element of that in, in what you're dis describing. So, you know, the same thing happens in dating, particularly among uh, kind of the superstar male daters. Um, is, is this just kind of a, 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 I mean, is this a reversion back to hunter gatherer world, right? you know, a move away from, you know, uh, pair, pair bonding? I mean, what, what, cause it does seem to be a product of the reduced friction costs associated with, with matching, right? Well, I think that's right. I think it is, but I don't think it's, I don't think we're going back to hunter gatherer times. I'm happy to say, I do think, um, I, I think that, yeah, I mean, this, this is also the you're hinting at what's also known as the superstar effect, where uh, which was uh, formulated by Sherwin Rosen, who is the most who was one of the most classical Chicago economists, who, as you suggested, should have been uh, single for his whole life, but wasn't. So presumably he figured it out. Um, and his insight was that over time, technology really allows us to enjoy the best. So let's go back to Mike Trout for a second. In the old days, when when um, before I was even before I became a baseball fan, you could watch a game on TV, but it would be a black and white TV, and there would be some static, and it wouldn't be a great. So you know, if you were interested in baseball, you'd probably go watch the local American Legion game. Quality wasn't as good, but the quality of baseball wasn't as good, but you could see it better and you could interact with it better. Well, what's happened over time is now, you know, when you sit at home watching 
a baseball game on the big screen TV. I mean, why go to the ballpark? You're very comfortable that you can see the game way better. You go to a lot of people still go to the ballpark for the enjoyment of it, but you're much happier watching Mike Trout or somebody of the highest quality on a great screen than going to the local park and watching some mediocre American Legion game. And so as a result, money rains down on Mike Trout because millions of people watch him instead of many fewer people watching him while others are going out to the local park. Now, that's exact that that leads to a lot of inequality, as you said, where Mike Trout now makes more than you know Willie Mays ever dreamed of making, even though Willie Mays was the Mike Trout of his day. But that's been exacerbated by the inequality in the inequality in the economy more broadly. So not only is Mike Trout worth much more, but the CEOs and the private equity partners and the law lawyers at big firms and the whatever, they make so much more than people did in the old days because they have bigger spans of control. The same types of arguments for superstars apply there. So then the, they drive up the ticket prices at, you know, to buy a box at a Yankees game. People, people are willing to pay so much more than they used to because they're so rich. And that, so kind of there's this reinforcing cycle. I won't, I won't say virtuous cycle because I don't think it's actually good for society, but there's this reinforcing cycle where the rich are getting richer and making the baseball players richer. And, and it just all goes around, uh, to the benefits of a smaller and smaller set of people. Well, another thing in the, in the dating market, uh, is that, um, you know, you talk about uh, how, you know, the things that are measured are the things that will be used to evaluate, right, prospective matches. And when you can run a search and you have a couple criteria that you can use for your filter, right, presumably like age and um, height and so forth, then, you know, you're going to emphasize those. Presumably you don't have a filter for, you know, personality or, you know, kindness or anything like that. And so would this, does this like skew in investment? towards those things which are being used as the evaluative uh, uh, metrics you, you didn't you didn't mention in the book um doing anything to you know improve your you know image right but that a lot of people evaluate based on images and and even though you you mentioned that you know small lies are are are, are helpful i don't think you actually did lie about much did you in your profile well, okay. So it's what's interesting is from the dating perspective, there's this is one place where economics. Remember, that book was called Everything I Need to Know About Economics I Learned from Online Dating. It is not called Everything I Need to Know About Online Dating I Learned from Economics because there are things economists don't teach you that you need to know to participate in the dating market. So, for example, you're referring, you know, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. People lie on dating sites all the time about objective things. And that's just pure economics. It's, it's, it's um, models of cheap talk, right? And because they can be verified later. So if I say I'm rich and I'm not, or if I say I'm six foot two and I show up and I'm five foot four, that's, you're going to end the date right away. If I say I'm six, if I'm five foot 11 and I say I'm six feet just to make meet your filter, maybe I can get away with that. So that's a rational, that's a rational lie. And economists have very good models for that. There's a whole separate set of um, there's a whole separate set of incentives to lie, which economists aren't very good at explaining, and that's more lying to yourself. Okay, so for example, when I was dating, I mean, you a lot. Everybody says they're a lot of fun and they're and they're very upbeat. They always say that you know everybody focuses on how optimistic they are on their dating sites. Uh, well, you know, the, I think those people really perceive they are optimistic. And then when you meet them, they're not all, we're, we're not all, we feel our self image isn't always correct. So there's, that's where you need a social psychologist side as well to evaluate the dating market. But I do think, you know, the, the key takeaway from all of this isn't, isn't that you should lie. People always would read my book and say, oh, you you think you should lie on dating sites. And I was, no, no, that's not the takeaway at all. The takeaway is you should think carefully about the incentives for somebody to say something and you should accept that maybe what somebody is saying isn't truthful, right? And in the sports book, 
I sort of get at that theme in a different way, which is if you just look at the statements by people on Sports Center and during interviews, it, people tend to take those at face value much too much. And and the the most salient example is doping. If you look at the quotes by Alex Rodriguez, like a week before he was caught doping, or by Lance Armstrong, like a month before he went on Oprah, they, it's, you know, they're things are people say a lot of things and if you as a you don't have to be a cynic you don't have to be a bad person but if just as a skeptical person you stop and say well what are their incentives to say that then you begin to not unfortunately you begin to not trust a lot of people but i think uh that's appropriate if not uh exactly the the best way for us to go through life, but it is. The well, I mean, the dating way. market is still, even with these dating sites, um, it's still kind of a, a direct search market, right? I mean, yes, the, some of the dating sites use algorithms that are primitive versions of what kind of Google and Facebook are using. But at the end of the day, there's just a lot of search costs that are incurred on, on both sides. And, and it seems, I mean, one would predict if one, if this was not kind of the dating market, if it was some other market, one would predict that you would have more kind of search firms, right? Considering the, the magnitude, the importance of this, yeah. right? I mean, this is one of the most important things that, you know, you do with your life. You're going to spend, you know, half your life with somebody, right? Um, and yet, you know, all of this effort is wasted in, in search costs. Why aren't there more kind of, you know, marriage brokers, uh, dating brokers? I mean, obviously there are parts of the world where the dominant market format is, you know, a, a broker. There's no, there are no dealer markets as far as I know, but, but you know, they're, they're, they're broker markets. Why, <laughs> why is this broker market not really taken off? I don't know. That's a great question. I mean, you do see a few people do this. There's still a couple of dating services that are more individual people using their networks or using, um, it, or helping you to figure out, but I agree with you. It, I think you, I think you framed the question really nicely by saying the rewards to finding the right person here are very high. So why aren't we willing to spend more up front? And I guess my best guess at that is that there aren't that many people who are better at figuring out what I want than I am myself. Right. So I go to a, I go to a broker, a realtor, if I'm going to buy a house, because I know that realtor knows a lot more about houses than I do. But when I go to look for a spouse, why would I, I guess people don't trust that someone else is going to be in a better position to know that they are. I don't know. It's an interesting question. Why don't we, somebody, sh I mean, I'm enough of an economist and believer in rational markets to think there are that somebody would have fixed this problem mm -hmm. using a broker market if that was the right way to fix this market. Because it's not like, yeah, I mean, the, my willingness to pay for the right mate yeah. is very high. Well, not anymore. I have, just for the record, I have the perfect <laughs> mate. But Of course you do. <laughs> uh, actually, actually, she's read the chapter on search costs. She knows that I don't believe there's such a thing as a perfect mate. But yeah. I have a great mate. Let's just say that. And... Um, so I don't know. It's a really that you, you raise an interesting question. Somebody should go out there and try to uh, crack this market. We have, by the way, I'm bringing it, bringing it back to the labor economics that drove my interest or whatever in this to begin with. You do see, of course, tons of headhunters out there do, who are being brokers in the mm -hmm. market for labor. And they get what executive and, an executive um, search firm now probably maybe, gets what they get uh, most of the first year salary or something like that. I mean, it's it's a huge amount, something like that, or a third, maybe a third. Sports of, maybe agents third get what two or three percent like of the contract. Yeah, I want to say three or four percent, but you know, and and maybe a little higher in some sports. So there's a lot of money out there, but like. Just because there's no money in finding a mate doesn't mean there's not value. I should be mm -hmm. willing to pay a lot to. But, but I guess the, you know, the, the simple answer may be that that person is not going to do a better job of it than I do. Whereas in finding employees, we do believe people do a well, better job, but I don't know, by the same token, the screening part, 
a lot of what headhunters do isn't picking, it's screening. And so you've got to believe somebody could do the screening for me more efficiently than I could have done it myself. But I don't know, those markets are not very, those broker markets are not very well developed. And I think you raise an interesting question. Well, there are two things I don't understand about the, the these dating services. I mean, the one hand is that the business model seems to mitigate against successful matches, right? Because, you know, the minute you get a successful match, the <laughs> revenue, you know, stops coming in. So that that's a problem. There's no, there's no kind of performance reward, um, you know? Well, I mean, you could think about in the long, hopefully there is in the reputation of the site. So if you have a matching site and you're well known for, if, if you're a lot of your friends say, oh, I met and mate, you know, met my spouse through, in my case, J date, and it was great and it was easy. And that's going to lead to more people coming. So as long as, it doesn't have to be the same people as repeat customers. If word of mouth can, can but, but we don't, we, we don't, but problem. we don't rely on, but we I don't do rely on word of mouth Obviously. for any other service. We, we want to see, you know, like we want to know which university, what's the job placement rate coming out of Stanford. Right. And we want to compare it to the job placement rate coming out. of. Well, you know. I don't know a lot, a lot of, but a lot of markets we, we rely on word of mouth, right? How did you get, how do you get the people who come and do various services in your house? Poorly. How do you get, um, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. No, I, but I do agree with you. Obviously the dating in the short term, the dating sites all have an incentive to not have you be successful because your monthly uh -huh. subscription fee is going to go away as soon as you find. The other thing I don't person. understand is why they don't use actual real data. Right. So I had some students in my class who came up with an idea for a dating site where they would actually scrape your kind of, you know, your location data and your, 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 you know, your, 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 uh, activity data. So if you say like, oh, I'm, I'm fit. It's like, well, Fitbit says you don't ever get off the couch. Right. Or, um, you know, <laughs> you like to go to the symphony, but you haven't been there in 10 years. Like what, right. With all the, the data out there, you, you think you could just upload your entire profile. I was wondering why does Amazon not get in this business? Cause they, they know like your, all your book purchases and, and so forth. And they could probably, um, I mean, I think Facebook tried to get in this business and they, they, they have a miserable, miserable failure. Yeah, they failed. Yeah, I don't know. I think your point is good. But and then, you know, of course, you might as well take it to the next extreme then and ask, why don't the dating sites like the job market sites like the Uber and so forth? Have you rate people yeah. when you're done? Yeah. <laughs> Terrible <And so>, date. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you right. rate the people you'd exactly, exactly testimonials? And, um, there were, there have been a exactly testimony. Why is, why isn't that done? And you know, there's obvious sort of answers for that, but uh, it is, it is one of the limits of the dating market relative to say Uber and these other matching markets where we get to give each other ratings and quickly um, uh, help the people who are good become well, I think there's also successful. kind of limits on um on kind of the extent to which we can run experiments so in in the first chapter of your your book uh on sports you say you know should is going to benefit your kid to participate in, in sports and you know yeah. we, we have some correlational data but we don't really have any good kind of longitudinal kind of experimental results right no one's ever done like a farm well even with a farmington study right they never told people to eat certain things but you know Presumably we could do this and, yeah. you know, we're, we're doing these interventions in, you know, lower income countries around education. Maybe we could do the same thing around kind of ath athletics. I had a conversation with um, uh, a professor at Boston University recently about arts education. And, they, you know, they were trying to find some yeah. kind of relationship between arts education and performance on standardized tests. And they, they, they said they couldn't, they couldn't really say anything about it, right? There, there was no conclusive evidence one way or the yeah. other, even though all the advocates of arts education want to promote this idea, but there's really no good solid evidence. And same thing with athletics. We, we, we tend to think, oh yeah, yeah, athletics is good for you. Athletics will make you a better person. Athletics will give you higher income and so forth. But, but we really don't know that, do we? No, absolutely not. We don't know that at all. And especially when you think about what else you could do at the time. And don't get me wrong, like my kids played sports and they were on teams and we loved it. Like I, they loved it. And, you know, I relived my childhood vicariously through them in all the unhealthy ways <laughs> grown men do when watching their children play sports. And it all worked out fine. But 
you know, the idea that this has made them, my son's a lawyer and my daughter is now about to go to business school. The idea that they are doing that, that they're, that those, they're better at those things or they were more able to achieve those things because of the little league teams they were on or the uh, high school softball team my daughter was on. I mean, there's just no evidence to support that. Doesn't mean it's, we don't know that it's wrong, by the way. It might be the case. But had my children instead spent more time learning musical instruments, would would that have hurt them or helped them more? We just don't know. And it's a really interesting question because we spend so much time worrying about which activities our kids are doing. And so that's why, you know, my message in the book is, don't, you know, just let your kid be a kid. And the idea that they're going to work on something and get good at something, that does seem naturally, intuitively right. Although we <laughs> like if my kids had taken the time they used playing Little League to play with Legos instead, would they be any worse off? We don't we don't even know they'd that be, that's they'd be true. the founder of a unicorn by now, I'm sure. So exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I should have had them doing unicorn so I could retire now and live off of their income. But you, in some of your work, you talk about kind of path dependence, right? You know, there's an article that you wrote about how, you know, your first job out of PhD program makes a big difference, right? You know, you, you go to a top school, you're going to be more productive. You know, we, we have this tendency to think that, yep. you, you know, water finds its level, right? So if you're, if you're high quality, you're going to ultimately f make your way to, uh, you know, the place that can make the most of your talents. And if you're kind of low quality, you'll same thing will happen. But, but you say that like initial conditions uh, matter, um, you know, and you have some natural experimental evidence to kind of, kind of support this. It, it seems like that must be true yeah. in sports as well. Right. I mean, you know, we're both in the Bay area. There's this, you know, Andrew Wiggins story that everyone's fascinated by. And, you know, people talk about, you, you know, during the, the draft, it's all about, finding a good fit between the, the team and, and the player. And if you have a bad fit, you might actually even damage the, the player, you know, beyond, beyond repair. Um, do you think that job seekers think enough about fit and about kind of, I know companies now advertise because the turnover is so rapid. They advertise not like, Oh, you'll, you'll be able to get a pension from us in 50 years. They say, here are the skills you'll have when you leave us in a year. Cause we know you're going to leave us in, in a year. So it's more of like the university type yeah. model. Do, do you think that, is yeah. that just in tech or, or, you know, is, do, do people elsewhere fail to think about the complementarities and the, you know, the, 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 the potential that they can get from the, from their, from their employer? Well, well, I think that, yeah, I, it's a good, that's a very good question. Um, and I don't have good experimental evidence to, to answer it. But I do think that, yes, people don't think enough maybe before starting jobs. But I also think you don't know until you've started. And so, you know, really learning, figuring out on the job just what does and doesn't work takes some time and you sometimes have to try things before you know for sure, right? So that's why turnover is pretty high when you're young and um, it it slows rapidly when you get older. I mean, I've been at Stanford for 22 years or something now. Um, so I do, but I do think the right match matters. Having said that, the point of some of the papers I've written is is a broader, is the broader point you're getting at. And that is, luck matters and you don't know until you've tried something how well it's going to work out and whether you're going to get lucky or not there are some broad parts of luck like starting during a good point in the job market versus recession but then there's other sorts of just completely random things that change your whole future um you know i can look back at a couple of points in my own life where i just got really lucky and connected in a way that ended up moving me from Northwestern to Stanford and other other events. Now, having said that, by the way, I don't think we should think, oh, it's all luck. I mean, people wrote those, read those papers I wrote and they're like, oh, well, you know, everything's luck. That's not true at all. Luck is, I'd, I'd much rather, as I, as I, you know, the papers, that paper showed you're better off if you graduate during good economic times than during a recession. But as I often say, I would much rather be 
really talented and graduate during a steep recession than be untalented and graduate at a boom time. Sure, I'm going to be more likely to get lucky in the latter scenario, but so that over time things catch up, that's true to some degree. Mm -hmm. And if you're really talented, you're going to end up doing well, fine well, so no matter in, what. In these matching markets, right? So employers are spending an awful lot of resources to try and figure out, right, which employees they're going to yeah. find useful, right? And, you know, productive. But but it seems like the, the, the job seekers don't necessarily have the same amount of information. I mean, you, you know, you can go to Glassdoor and see some ratings and so forth, but it's difficult for them to know exactly what they're going to get out of the job, right? Again, that's word of mouth. And same thing with universities, right? I think when you're applying to university, it's, it's kind of hard to know which university is going to kind of add the most value for you. I mean, you can look at the U.S. news ratings and so forth, but based on your specific characteristics, I interviewed someone from UCLA recently who said that, hey, you know, if you're someone who is, you know, it's better to be the, the, the top of your class in, say, um, a, a, you know, a tier two school than bottom of your class in a, in a tier one school. If that's true, yeah. it's not something that I don't think 90% of the applicants probably are unaware of this, right? They just think, oh, you know, I got into Stanford. I yeah. got to go to Stanford, right? They're not going to turn down Stanford for, you know, San Jose State, even if the, the data would suggest that the latter might be a better, you know, place for them, depending on, on their, you know, ambitions. Do we, do we need to kind of figure out ways to get better information to, to, to you know, university applicants and job applicants? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, let's take the university example first, because it's um, a little easier to do that because, again, it's more homogeneous, right? Everybody's coming into the same type of program at the same time. Whereas if you look at jobs, there are so many different jobs at a company, it might be harder to sort of get the proper information. But sure, when you think about the, the I mean, it's just a classic thing that empirical economists are always dealing with. It, in, as an individual, when you go and look at what are the career outcomes or the graduate school outcomes of people who go to a certain undergraduate institution, you look at the outcomes for everybody and you're just automatically mixing up what economists would say is um, the treatment effect and selection effect, right? So people from Harvard, people who graduate from Harvard on balance are going to do a lot better than people who graduate from the University of Massachusetts and Amherst, which is the best state school in Massachusetts. There's just no question. But what we don't know from looking at those numbers is, is the person who gets into both places um, going to do better if they go to Harvard? And the data on this are not, there, there's interesting studies done by economists on this. They come to somewhat different conclusions. There's some evidence that it does, you know, you should go to Harvard. And then there's some evidence that, well, conditional on getting into both, maybe it doesn't matter that much, especially if you're from a family that's already somewhat connected. So maybe if you're from a disadvantaged family, the Harvard effect is much bigger because it opens up a world you wouldn't otherwise get into. But you're absolutely right. Helping people to understand that difference is really important. I mean, you see that also, by the way, just when people buy homes. People buy homes based on the mm -hmm. local SAT scores. Well, your kids' SAT scores might be low, even if the rest of the neighborhoods are high, right? So you have to think about, well, if my kid goes to the school system, is that going to make their SAT scores high? Or are they going to be in a school with all these other smart kids whose scores are going to be high, but that has no effect on how my kid's going to do? People are bad at understanding the difference between it and at, at, at understanding that when they see averages, that yeah. those are mixing treatment and selection effects. And and that's definitely true of employers, as, you know, when picking well, I mean, jobs home buying, well. I mean, I, I got to spend about a half hour touring the house that I bought, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you don't get to spend the night in the house. You don't get to, you know, even spend an hour and a half in the house. I mean, you you come in, you look around and, and you, you, you're out, right? And that's a huge, huge, huge decision because you're going to spend, you know, a big chunk of your life in this place. And, and I probably spent more time shopping around for, you know, a, a, a ticket to the East Coast on, on kayak than, than I did like, you know, <laughs> buying my house, which 
it's, it seems like these super important decisions, like what university you go to, what job you take, and you know who you wind up uh, marrying, it's almost like we underinvest in them relative to buying a stove or, or you know, buying a, a, a plane ticket or, you know, something that's a lot less, less meaningful or important. Well, I don't, I don't know if this is a better, I don't know if this is a better or worse way of interpreting it, but that's not necessarily wrong or inefficient because it may be that yeah. it's just hard to gather that information. Right. So if, if, you know, and take the case of dating, yeah. We do spend a lot of time. We try dates, right? So we don't pick the house is a different example because you pick that house. Now you can get out of it. You can sell and move, but the dating market, we actually yeah. do spend a lot of time. I mean, I went on a lot of dates before I married my wife. Now the housing market, did you really only spend a half? It's a half hour. I probably, I don't know how much. Well, I spent time more I spent. than that looking. I spent years looking. Yes, but exactly. In terms of the actual house, like yeah, it's I, interesting. I, I was I couldn't I couldn't see I, how I couldn't even measure like what what's the noise like at night? Like, am yeah. I going to be yeah. up all night because of traffic? You know how how are you going to unless you camp out in the lawn? Like, how are you going to know this stuff? Did your real? I mean, I think you also kind of hopefully your realtor would have helped you with any real red flags, but. So they, that's they just where steer you expert... to the most expensive property, right? <laughs> yeah. right? Or the one, or the one where they get the other side of the commission too, or something like that. Yes, incentives are very strong. As as we going back to where we started. Well, one of the things that that I think, um, you, you know, there's a whole chapter on uh, positive assortative mating. You know, I've interviewed a lot of biologists and and uh, about you know similar topics. It seems like. Um, you know, the, the creating more liquidity in the kind of mating market is going to facilitate more positive assortative mating, at least along certain dimensions. I know there's lots of different there's disagreements over what counts as, you know, positive, but some people think that this will lead to kind of more social stratification, right? So mm -hmm. think about social mobility. There's a lot of ways you can do social mobility. One is to go to, you know, education, another is, you know, through work, uh, but, but another way is, is through marriage, right? So marriage has always been a way for, for people to kind of, kind of climb the, the social ladder. Um, but it seems like maybe that's less likely if people can screen for, you know, education or, 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 or wealth, right? Um, you know, my, my, my parents came from kind of opposite sides of the, of the track, so to speak, and, in you know, and, and met through, Per personal connections and not, not through, obviously through <laughs> online, online <laughs> on dating is, 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 is there a danger that the A's are all going to, I mean, not a danger. I mean, is, 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 is the social optimum better if we have the A's matched with the A's and the Z's matched with the Z's or is, is it, I know in the workplace it's going to be different, but in, in the mating market is, is kind of happiness maximized on a societal basis. If we, have all the A's with the A's and the, and the Z's with the Z's? Um, wow, that's a tough question. <laughs> uh, I don't, I mean, let me put it, let me, let me not take a, a stand on what's philosophically best. Let's just say nature leads towards all else equal, the A's and the A's hanging with mm -hmm. the A's and the Z's hanging with the Z's. So if we let nature take its course, that's going to happen. And the question is, is the world moving more in that direction? And and I guess it has to some degree, but not. You know, in the New York Times, I know they, they talk about the marriage section as the mergers and acquisition section, <laughs> right? I never, you know, I never where, heard that. Yeah, that's that's in the East Coast. That's what we call it, the mergers and acquisitions section, right? But I everyone just rattles off, you know, the, par the parental credentials of you exactly. know, the schools they went to. Exactly. And, the, and the, you know, this guy works at Morgan and, and you know, Stanley and she works at Goldman Sachs and they're, you know, getting married. But I do think, you know, if you, this is where universities and schools have an obligation or at least a, a role to play in helping people whose backgrounds would lead them to be mm -hmm. stuck with other people from lousy backgrounds to have a chance an opportunity to change their lot in life, which can be through the job market, the marriage market or whatever. And so universities, you see them trying to re reach a broader audience and um, do a greater de degree of 
created a greater degree of social mobility. And I think that's fantastic. I mean, at Stanford, we're working very hard at Berkeley and other schools, working very hard to bring in people from lower socioeconomic status. Now that, that can be, um, it can be difficult because while they're in school, you know, there are the people who are like, let's go to Tahoe for the weekend and every, you know, something there. And other people are like, okay, you know, what, I'm, I'm going to have to sleep outside, but okay, I'll go. So there are downsides of that for sure. But I don't, I, um, I think nature does, you know, you said you've talked to biologists. It's not just humans. This positive assertive mating is an economic concept, but it's a biological concept as well. At least it has been. And it's, you see it in humans and I don't know, I, I won't say it's good or bad, mm -hmm. but it's natural. Yeah. Well, in the workplace, I think there's some interesting research that suggests that, you know, you want to take your most productive people and um, diffuse them right throughout the organization. And, and I, yeah, you know, I, I have exactly. some, some, uh, some, exactly. some colleagues and friends that did that research. And, and what, what I was wondering is, you know, why is it then that the productive people, their positive externality, if you call it that, exceeds the negative externality of the slackers, right? Because yeah. one would think, you know, you put one bad apple in a, in a basket, yeah. it's going to cause them all to rot. But instead, you know, it's, you put one good apple in, in, in the basket and it kind of suppresses the, the, the rot, so to speak. So why, why do we have any insight into why that, that happens? I don't, I don't personally know. So it's a great question. I've, I've seen some of these papers as well, but I think it's important to keep in mind that we're not talking about like, you know, the most incredible people in the world along some dimension and the biggest slackers. We're talking about within a firm, which is already selected because of the positive assertive mating we're talking about, which is already somewhat selected around relatively homogeneous people. Then within those smaller bands that you find at firm, you want to match the best performers with some of the people who can learn a lot from them. But I don't know that that, that would hold if you randomly picked people in firms and you had the full distribution of talents in a given firm. I'm not sure the same mm -hmm. insight would hold. Right. So that's that's a careful caveat because you, you're already looking at a very selected set when you look within a firm. So so final question, um, you know, when when you look out into the world, right, you can look at it through this economic economics lens. And I think a lot of the students that come through, you know, economics majors or through business schools, they also can look at the world through the economics lens. Is the economic lens something that once you put them on, like you can't you can't take them off or. Or are they lenses that you can kind of, you know, put on or off? I mean, you know, when you when you look at your your kids, do you think, okay, that's a that's a durable durable investment, good right there? I mean, is there is? I remember overhearing some folks. I, I tell my students this is a joke. You know, when I overheard a bunch of MBA students talking about shorting their partners uh, and thinking about the N NPV of their of their of their of their spouses, that's when I realized there's you know maybe there, maybe there's a bit of a problem there. Do 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 you think that the the economic <laughs> lens is something that once acquired um, kind of sticks with you? Is it something that you can have as you know just one of many lenses? Uh, and uh, is there any, is there any are there any kind of cor corrupting or corrosive uh, effects that you know you can imagine if people don't put their economic lens in, in context or in, in uh, proportion to, you know, the other perspectives they might have? Yeah. Well, first of all, the real corrupting thing is when your spouse overhears <laughs> you talking about their MPV or your children overhear you referring to them as a durable good, you have a problem and you're going to need new spouses and children anyway. So, so there's, there's certainly, uh, keep in mind that the lens you have doesn't have to be the lens you speak with. <laughs> that's an important insight. Um, I do think once you, I mean, that's a great question. Look, I'm, I became an economics professor. I bought into the economic way of thinking hook, line and sinker. And yes, I think about economics all the time. I mean, I think about everything in the econ through an economic lens. My, my mother-in-law once said to me just after, you know, some conversation, she said, do you always think this way? And the answer is yes, I, I do. Um, but I don't think everybody has to go all in the, the way. I mean, hope that what I try to do with both 
the book about dating and the book about sports and when I teach MBA students here isn't to get them to think every moment like an economist. It's to get them to see some of the economics that they wouldn't otherwise see and get some insights from that. And um, But yeah, for me personally, there's no going back <laughs> well, at this point. And I don't, but for the record, I don't ever think of the NPD okay, of good. myself. Good, we'll, we'll, so. we'll be sure to put that in, in the recording. Um, so uh, the two books that you have here, Everything I, I Never Needed to Know About Economics I Learned from Online Dating and An Economist Goes a Game, they're both wonderful examples of how you can um, reach into your economics toolbox, grab a couple uh, you know, tools and, and frames, and it kind of clarifies and uh, you know puts into focus a, a lot of things that you wouldn't kind of normally understand so clearly. So I, I really appreciate that. And, you know, I, I think you could probably take this approach to pretty much every aspect of, of you know, <laughs> of the human experience. Uh, and so you've got a, a lot of work cut out for you for the next couple of decades. Paul, thanks so much for joining me. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.